we were whole hours living on a prayer, choking on the gases stifling the air. Scrub and rinse the cotton, dreams long since forgotten, fears are hushed, rules are crushed by the cruel routine of the mere regime. Learn to work the system, learn to play the game. Push your weight enough so others get the blame. Strain with each endeavor, hold yourself together. Keep no space, keep no place, and show no fear when the boss comes near. The Happy Prince is a modern fairy tale for our times. Oscar Wilde's themes are just as poignant today as when he first wrote the fairy tale as a bedtime story for his two children back in 1888. It's not so much a love story, but a story about love and how far one would go to make the ultimate sacrifice. So what follows here is a montage of scenes, uh, excerpts from the show accompanied by some narrative, which although only a glimpse of the piece, I hope captures its essence. The musical opens in the grim world of a post-war laundry. It's the sort of place where each person's survival depends entirely on another's misfortune where dreams of freedom, light, and escape are the workers' daily ritual. Through the twilight, failing eyes no longer see. In my twilight, Henry's smile will comfort me. Poor child, he lies in bed at home. He's sick with fever all alone. In the twilight. Ellie, one of the workers, has rescued an injured swallow on her way to work that morning and tries to hide it from her fellow workers. She's eventually saved by George, the boss's son, who breaks up the fight. Mr. Meir and Mrs. Bentley, their unsavoury bosses, interrupt proceedings to sing the daily anthem. Work is the only way forward in this life. All these workers that I employ, and that includes yourself, my boy, must strive to the sun, like my old man said, for the country, the king, and your daily bread. Arduous said solemn means strive forth towards the sun. Living by this motto is my golden rule of thumb. Launder up the ladder till you reach the highest rung And then you will aspire to what your father has become Mr. Mayor, please do not forget The reason you're still here, my pet Is that when the business went up the spout It was me that you called in to bail you out How can I forget, Mrs. Bentley? I was there to save you when the bailiffs caused a stink Salvaging a laundry that was teetering on the brink. You 
would now be bankrupt and locked up inside the clink. But Mrs. B would not agree to let the empire sink. Mrs. Friendly, where would I be without you? I think we both know where you'd be, Mr. Mir. I keep those old account books just to remind me of how things were before I strived towards the sum. I'll do a set soul of me strive forth towards the sun. Living by this motto is my golden rule of thumb. Launder up the ladder till you reach the highest rung. So I'll do a set soul of now and wipe the sweat from off your now and launder. What? It's Ellis. We saw her bring it in, didn't we, Daisy? She did. Hand it over. Now! Please be careful. Oh, it's alive! It's a bird. It's injured. How oh, dare you bring what? this dirty, filthy, flea-ridden bird into this laundry, Lizzie? Throw that disgusting thing on the fire. I'll talk to you later. Oh, Mr. Mir, something for my nerves. Oh, there will be oh, consequences. Ellie now makes a perilous journey up the ladder towards the factory roof to try and release the bird through a broken pane of glass in the skylight. I let go, lose my grip, feel the slip as we plunge into the air. Spread my wings, let go things like I never had a care. All at once, flying free as a swallow in the sky. How they all seem so small from 10,000 feet up high. <gasps> As she journeys along the gantry bridge, it collapses and she falls to the ground. The world of the laundry freezes. Ellie now rises up slowly and majestically as a swallow. We now see everything through Ellie's eyes and imagination as the laundry transforms into a town. At the center of the town square stands the golden statue of the Happy Prince in which the townspeople place all their hope and trust. The arrival of the newly elected mayor interrupts proceedings. He chastises his people for idolizing a worthless statue, telling them to put their trust in him instead. Here I am, a self-made man, devoting himself to the people in need. From benefit function to charity luncheon, I do my bit. Toil through grit, putting smiles on the faces of children I feed. Nonetheless, some profess I won the election by cunning and stealth. There was no collusion or cause for confusion. The vote was fair, checked with care. I went through the trouble to count them myself. And now you have voted me back into power. I have to forewarn you that things may turn sour. If those here in debt to me dare to refuse to pay me their taxes, their rents, and their dues. Lizzie Darkin, step forward. It is one petty thief. When I ask for a rent, say the funds have been spent and then plead with remorse for my pity. 
after week. It is vermin like these who are spreading disease in a proud and industrious city. Oh, why do you bite the hand that feeds you when you know your neighbor needs you to repay your debt? Please, your worship, I was gonna and pay you. Alfred Dyer, with your drunk begging ways and lamentable gaze, how I loathe the excuses you utter. A soldier of war who could not see it through, and as most cowards do, ended up with his life in the garter. Soldiers of arms and join the fight now, scavengers have no more right now, begging in the street. Now get up on your feet. Ellie, our swallow, arrives in this new town with her companions on their way to Egypt. She is captivated by the golden statue of the happy prince and decides to stay. Look at this, a golden bedroom. What a strange thing. There's not a cloud in the sky and the stars are clear and bright, yet I felt a drop of rain. What's the use of a statue if it cannot keep off the rain? The statue's eyes are full of tears. Who are you? I am the Happy Prince. Well, why are you weeping then? I mean, you've quite drenched me. Perhaps it. you should find a nice dry chimney pot. Well, it's only for one night. When the sun rises, I will fly to Egypt. Though, this is my first flight to Egypt. But I know what I will see when I get there from all the stories I've been told. Just thinking about Egypt makes me feel warmer. The prince is shining in the moonlight. That night, Minnie, a seamstress, begins to tell her sick child the story of the happy prince. The prince then takes over the story, revealing his past to the swallow. When I lived, I had a human heart. I did not know what tears were for. I lived in a land where sorrow was banned and hatred shut away behind its door. All he knew was perfect happiness. And all that I saw enchanted me, for nothing, nothing here could, could intervene to, to suffer the illusion. the garden there ran a lofty wall that reached high into the air. Well, why didn't you fly over the wall? A fortress put in place to protect me from the face of despair. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot you can't. And so I lived and died and they set me up so high and a swallow what of you I saw. For the sight had been forbidden was a city that lay hidden, rotten to the core, wretched and poor. So each day I must atone For a life I live for pleasure alone When my gorgeous call me the happy prince And even though my heart is made of lead 
how it aches, now I see what is beyond the palace walls. The swallow takes pity on the prince and becomes his messenger. They decide to help the seamstress and her sick child by giving away the ruby from the prince's sword hilt. The swallow falls asleep at the foot of the statue as the early snows of winter begin to fall. Time has passed and the scheming mayor has tightened his grip upon the town. Act two begins in the basement of the town hall, where we see the workers burning all the possessions of those people in the city who can't pay their taxes and rents. On another floor, we see the clerks and the secretaries who are all blue with cold, as there's no heat where they are. The mayor is giving Mrs. Bentley a tour of the town hall, explaining his scheme, which saves the town both money and waste. Shall we proceed? More treats, dear mayor. You really are spoiling me. Soak the boilers, turn your working days crust. The air is chilled with winter's crust. The pounding body seems to cough. Things to be strained to grip. The quills they hold is more than cough can bear. That's this is just so cold. Would you like me to bring you anything when I return in the spring? Swallow, would you not stay with me one night longer? Oh, but they're waiting for me in Egypt, and they've told me about all the marvellous things to be seen as they fly along the second cataract. There are bullfrogs that croak in the reed beds. There are ibis which stand along the shore, catching goldfish in their beaks while the dozy hippo sleeps. To the line and the cataracts roar. There are merchants who cross the sand dunes who are led by the stars along the way. And they dance around the fire so the omens will conspire to bring fortune to every day. The prince now asked the swallow to pluck out one of his sapphire eyes to give to Alf, a destitute soldier. The swallow reluctantly agrees to do this. Meanwhile, the town ball is in full swing.
During the ball, the mayor has slipped away to his attic lair, where we find him counting all the rents and taxes that he's stolen from the town. His disappearance, however, has not escaped the notice of Mrs. Bentley, who is only too willing to become his accomplice. The happy prince, always watching, and he seems to be winking at me now. <laughs> Each day I feel his glare. Each way I look, he undermines me with his stare. Pathetically, prophetically, gazing down from high. A worthless relic with his sunlight tinted eyes. Only fools worship Jews, the town has been cajoled. What it is now are real men who change the world. Get a grip, helmless ship, in me they have a leader, not some impotent deceiver clad in gold. A plinth is not my style, no, I don't need pedestals to elevate my smile. I'm a droll, cheery soul, but clearly what I lack is how to turn their heads from him and win them back. But in time they'll be mine, I look them in the eyes But they can find in that imposter in the sky Taunting me, haunting me, he mocks me with affection With that glittering complexion I despise Quite agree, silly me. Engravings on a stone cup are not the stuff of kings who sit upon a throne. That will do, think it through, men like you and pride. Who need a woman's heart in which they can confide. Of course they do, clever you. The people might draw mayors with no statue of a mayoress by your side. Hide. Now meet the three victims in their night meditations with the statue. The match girl turns to the prince for hope, while the seamstress thanks the prince for her ruby, and the swallow delivers the sapphire to the soldier. Gracious Lord, can this be the ruby missing from your precious sword? City of lies and The swallow dreams of Egypt, happily reunited with her companions. The sun god Ra burns in golden splendor. But when visions of the prince and the poor of the town appear, entreating her to stay, her swallow friends desert her, and she wakes fitfully from her slumber.
The swallow returns to the prince to say goodbye. She's given away his other sapphire eye to the match girl and delivered all his gold leaf to the poor of the town. Although blind, the prince has gained his freedom of movement through every good act and now released from his purgatory, he wonders if they shall meet again. Will you still love me in paradise? Will I have the strength to love you? Now my lead heart has come apart, broken in two. How will I find you in eternity, if such a place exists at all? Will it all seem an unending dream? A place within the mind we're never meant to find. If I can't see you in paradise or hear the sound of your call, then there aren't angels in paradise after all. My suspicion is you are the, the scene is now interrupted by the arrival of the mayor and his entourage, who have come to pull down the statue of the shabby prince, who is stripped bare now of all his gold leaf and jewels. And as Oscar Wilde remarks, since he is no longer beautiful, he is no longer useful. And at the centre of the story, I think it's poignant that Wilde places a public statue, challenging us to question its worth and meaning. Tear down the statue, rip it down before my bare hands grip its crown and pour it to the floor. But then you worship. Melt it down to its core. Oh, no, no. You had to demolish this thing. Snow is falling, and the swallow leads the prince in his blindness as he supports her failing body. In the last scene, we return to the laundry. Ellie has revived from her fall and is now looked upon quite differently by the group, especially by Lizzie, her tormentor. And I think it's Oscar Wilde reminding us that the smallest acts in life are worth far more than the grandest gestures. Me? What do I want an old book for? I could teach you how to read. 
Nobody need to know. After work, maybe. Yeah. What do I need that for? Bleeding waste of time. I might. I'm not promising nothing. But I might. Maybe.